Video game piracy has been around for about as long as video games have been around, but PC gaming has noticeably had this problem more so than consoles because while playing a pirated NES game would require a lot more effort into dumping a game onto a physical cart, which is more common now than it was back then, it was a lot more common with computer gaming because you could easily go onto your computer and copy the contents of the game's floppy disk and put it onto a blank one that was intended for things like Word documents and digital art basically whatever you needed stored. So of course, these scurvy software pirates are the ones who would make a copy of the software they bought and sell multiple copies of it for much cheaper than full price and eventually make a profit. But others were just like the kids in the educational video called Don't Copy That Floppy. Buckle up folks, because we are about to embark on a journey through time to the cringe of yesteryear with Don't Copy That Floppy. I am Alec the Psyquestian Gentleman, and let us begin this video, shall we? I'm your MC, Double Death, DP, that's the disc protector for you and the posse, that's the artist, writers, designers, and programmers that work up the images for games and grammar that let you learn, but also play the game you came here for today. Before finding its way on YouTube, this was actually shown in many schools during the 90s, and this doesn't honestly surprise me because this, my friends, is corporate propaganda run by the Software Publishers Association and was made in collaboration with the Educational Section Anti-Piracy Committee, the Copyright Protection Fund, and Velarde Films. I'm not saying that software piracy isn't a victimless crime, as it does negatively affect artists who need sales profit to stay afloat in the capitalist modern world of today, and some of the points made in the video are valid, but the way this entire video is framed seems to be omitting a lot of valuable information and fails to address the other factors of copying that floppy. So this educational video begins with these two kids playing a multiplayer game on their school computer, even though the girl is doing nothing and the boy is hammering the keys randomly, getting frustrated, and somehow loses to her? Again, she's not doing anything. <laughs> like, what the hell? This is almost as if this scenario was written by someone who doesn't know how multiplayer games work, and it even stumbles on its own continuity in the end, whereas despite in the beginning, the kids would have to play their game another time as the next class is about to begin, they not only play another round 8 minutes later after the rap section of the video, but now she's joining in at the hammering of random computer keys, ruling out that they were playing a turn-based multiplayer game akin to the original Super Mario Bros. And also, Cory in the middle of the video later mentions that it's not a video game, but rather a science program. So, what exactly is it then? An edutainment game? I don't exactly see them doing chemical calculations on the fly. Like, that just sounds like a flat-out shoot-em-up game. Good work, folks. Four organizations in, and not one of them could establish a basic continuity to save their lives. With that said, these two kids are the straw men of the video. The boy Cory being the software pirate who doesn't see anything wrong with that, and the girl Jenny being the voice of reason between the two as she learns more about the dangers of copying that floppy so they could later play on Cory's brother's computer after school. And next thing you know, the taxpayer-funded computer glitches out and somehow plays a full-motion, uncompressed video in front of the kids back in the day before DVD-ROM was even a thing. And the video introduces the rapper named MC Double Def DP, played by Emmy Hart, and he is the one who provides the main arguments of the video. In the first three minutes, he raps about who he is, being the disc protector for you and the posse. The posse, of course, consisting of artists, writers, designers, and programmers, because of course they are. If you want to be hip with the kids, you gotta describe the people who you're defending as the posse. I gotta give this organization credit. It wants to be hip with the kids, and what better way than to reach the 90s kids than by delivering an educational message through a rap about software piracy. It's corny as hell, but it has my full attention, so it at the very least succeeded in that regard. I mean, it beats having a lawyer come into class and talking about the boring legal mumbo jumbo surrounding copyright law and how software piracy violates that. But 1 minute and 41 seconds in, DP makes a slippery slope fallacy in response to Corey's denial of the harms of copying the floppy. You say I'll just make a copy for me and a friend. 
friend Then he'll make one and she'll make one And where will it end? One leads to another, then ten, then more And no one buys any discs from the store So no one gets paid and they can't make more The posse breaks up and that closes the stores Don't copy, don't copy that floppy The problem is, DP states if everyone made a copy Then no one would buy the software from the store Because everyone is making copies while it is valid to state that owning pirated software with no intent to buy it later on is lost profit that's needed for the publisher to stay afloat, going to a doom and gloom scenario where no one would buy the game is completely false, otherwise it would have happened already. Because even though piracy can and will prevent potential sales, the slippery slope fallacy implies that no one will actively go to the store and buy it, as if the pirated copies make the ones being sold cease to exist when that's not really how it works at all. People are complex, and some have the resources to buy the software, while others like Cory are on a shoestring budget. Even though he had money left over from Christmas, making this whole thing just pointless. I'm not sympathizing with the software pirates at all. If I was making a video game and sold it out on the market, I would try to prevent it as much as possible, but not to the point where I'd tell flat out lies. I would just offer something better than the competition. Achievements, cloud saving, all the necessary things, rather than be like Sega did for Sonic Mania and implement de novo DRM. So I am simply trying to establish why retail software can still thrive, even if there is a pirate market out there. For one, given it's illegal, less people will be inclined to deal with the heavy fines and or imprisonment. And two, how is it going to end the computer age? Like, that is some next level fear mongering. And I just find it rich how he includes Tetris as a game that's gonna fail, because while creator Alexei Pajitnov did emigrate from his country to take control of his creation, it was originally made in the poster child of communism, being Soviet Russia. Would someone care to explain to me how a computer game for comrades made by comrades is going to fail when the Soviet Union itself owned Tetris originally? He did eventually get the rights to it, and now it's on more consoles and computers than I have cans of expired Albacore tuna, which is a lot. Yeah, even with pirated copies of Tetris going around, Tetris isn't failing anytime soon, even if it's no longer for comrades by comrades. Same with the other software mentioned, because the fact that these games are celebrated en masse to this day goes to show that they didn't fail despite software piracy happening in the time of their prime. I mean, good luck playing Carmen Sandiego without that encyclopedia. So, I know it's hindsight logic from a 2021 perspective, but this video came out in 1992, and computer software has been around for over a decade, so this isn't anything new, and if a dark age would come from video game piracy, then guess what? They'd already be experiencing it instead of prophesizing this supposed upcoming dark age. Anyways, the next two and a half minutes features people who work in the programming field for a living, as well as a lawyer, but the programmers are all from AOL, and while Craig's insight on Neverwinter Nights is welcome, the rest of them don't really say anything compelling in the case against piracy. Like, oh cool, instructions manuals, warranties, and upgrades. That would've been something to build off of, but instead, the lawyer gets to her scared straight portion of the program saying, we will go to jail if we copy that floppy, cause you gotta love them scare tactics. I get it, they need these jobs to survive, it's their passion. I'm not criticizing this portion for that specifically, I'm more so curious as to why these programmers are all from AOL. Like, couldn't you get several programmers from different companies? Like, AOL was extremely successful back in the 90s, with their online service completely unrelated to the sales of software. I would have preferred interviews by people from Sierra, Apogee, Epic Mega Games, LucasArts, or even id Software. Especially Apogee, as they innovated the shareware distribution method, whereas the first part of a full game was released completely for free, and you could copy it and share it with your friends, and usually at the end of the first part of that game, there would be information as to where to purchase the full game. This was first seen in Apogee's 1987 roguelike game called Kingdom of Kraz, and was later seen in 1992's Wolfenstein 3D, and even 1993's Doom. Other companies like Epic Mega Games also tried this out for games like Jill of the Jungle. So the neglect of mentioning shareware kind of paints a black and white point of view to copying software as being the end all be all evil, when there's just so much more to the discussion than that. So while mentioning the advantages of having a physical copy is very welcome, it's still an incomplete idea. 
Although to be fair, interspersing these interviews in the middle of the rap does disrupt the flow of it, and having it end as quickly as possible while getting out as much necessary information to the viewer as possible is the ultimate goal. But as it is, it just ends up only representing one point of view. You see, on these discs we have frozen in time the creativity of someone's mind. Oh god, it keeps going and going. Like, what else you got for us, DP? DP starts up again with a point about how creativity is protected by law, but it falsely equates creativity with a product being sold in question, because there are developers and there are publishers. The developers are the creative ones while the publishers pimp out their games and make most of the money. And while there are developers who self-publish their own software, a lot of the software is sold by other publishers, and in the 90s, programmers are at the whims of the corporations they work for. I mean, sure, some publishers do treat their developers with dignity and even reward them with bonuses and other benefits, but others, not so much. And sadly, that's still the case to this day. This video pretends that all software is controlled by the creator and ignoring the more disturbing reality that the corporations actually reap most of the harvest. I also hate how six minutes in, he equates software piracy as going to the store and just taking something. Like, that is not only a false equivalency, it's intellectually dishonest. If I go to the store and see a gallon of milk, I would buy it and use a duplication device to make hundreds of gallons of milk. Well, I own the milk I duplicated, and I did buy it with my own money, so that business relationship has ended. And when I own something, I can do whatever I want with it, within legal reason, of course. I'm not saying that's morally right, as corporations would stop buying milk from farmers if their product doesn't sell, but this is the only similar instance of software piracy I could find, and it's based on fantasy. So if anyone that you know keeps using this tired analogy, just give them a swift knock on the forehead with the palm of your dominant hand. Gotta love how Corey actually makes some sense about these companies having lots of money, and they keep hammering home how it's illegal to copy that floppy, and the kids are all like, I'm too young for a life of crime. But DP reiterates the point of view of how if we keep buying it, then the developers will keep on making them, and then he pixelates out of existence, saying, See ya, I'm out of here. And while he is the charismatic presence that makes this video a lot of fun to watch, he overall keeps pushing a lot of underbaked points that only give off the illusion of weight thanks to several sections of the video dedicated to telling you how illegal it is. And they never speak of shareware or even mention the free software movement whose focus is to guarantee the rights of software users like you and me. Some of these rights they propose include the right to run the software, analyze it, modify it, and share copies of it, which is the perfect counter-argument to why people should copy that floppy. It doesn't mean that developers can't make individual product keys to prevent sharing of the games with others. They could make their own disk formats, and people would have to buy a separate disk drive for it. But this group rather focuses on promoting the rights given to product owners. It's not anti-software developer, but as this video is, it only showcases the point of view of the software publishers, which while it does benefit the artists, it mostly benefits the CEOs, the executives, and the investors more so than the very people bringing these creations to life. With a few exceptions, of course. Although I do miss when software was locked behind individualized product keys rather than hardware damaging DRM, like today's anti-piracy software like DeNovo DRM, as I've previously mentioned, which makes it difficult to play a game without an internet connection. There's a right way and a wrong way to go about protecting your product, and Gabe Newell did say something to the extent that if you want to beat software piracy, you have to offer a service that is better than anything the scurvy software pirates can provide. Urgh, curse you when your clout saves Gabe Newell, but I do respect you, laddie. And that's a lesson something like Sonic Colors Ultimate could take a few notes on. Since that game is worse than an emulated version of Sonic Colors for the Wii, which you can play on Dolphin on your computer. So despite this video being dishonest and cringeworthy, I did enjoy it ironically. I love the performance by Emmy Hart as DP, and the special effects are so 90s, it's freaking charming. They definitely put in a lot of creative effort into the editing. Dare I say it looks better than the sequel? Yes, cherished viewers, after getting a resurgence of popularity thanks to YouTube and Google Video, it got a follow-up video called Don't Copy That in 2009. And holy crap, it is much worse than the original. Like, jeez, this is not even fun anymore. This is just dumb.
This video begins roasting the original for not only its campy nature, but also no longer applying in a floppy list digital age where you can literally just download an entire game to your computer just like the protagonist of this video. Even though that main menu does not look like any game from the current age of 2009. And the reason why I don't copy that is much worse than the original is because they doubled down on the punishment aspect of illegally copying software. He made a couple of flips, he thought his game was unlocked until the uniform man came at his door with a knock. Now he's got nothing to say, he's petrified and he's shocked. He was the king of the town, now he's the laugh of don't copy that. What? Why don't copy that? What? What? Why don't copy that? What? Why? Cause it's not just a copy, it's a crime. I mean, we get a mom arrested for her daughter's illegal downloading by a fake-looking militarized police force. We also get the protagonist dreaming he's in prison, getting hassled by the other prisoners, like they care that he's in there for software piracy, like come on. And Emmy Hart reprises his role as MC Double Def DP, now collaborating with a woman named Bishiba. It's a lot more pessimistic in tone compared to the original, which there's nothing wrong with, but it does show how much music has changed since the 90s. And while I do like the showcasing of the artists behind video games and the potential career options that artists can have, most of the video is basically, you're gonna go to jail and your life will be ruined. Regardless of the intent behind copying software for personal use, giving it to a friend, or selling it. And there is a big difference between those intentions, yet the video just doesn't care about that at all. And you gotta love how the video shows a fake newspaper article about one of the characters being a teenage girl making millions of dollars off selling pirated games. Because that house totally looks like something bought with a million dollars. Yes, I will take sh that didn't happen in real life for 500, Alex. So not only is this follow-up worse than the messaging, the acting is terrible, the use of interviews is manipulative, especially the prison interview with Jeremiah Mondello, who got busted and is serving four years in prison, and you would think it'd be for software piracy itself, but they intentionally don't specify exactly what his other charges were. And it doesn't take a detective to find out more about him, so I decided to get my friend to do some deep digging about these high charges. Hello everyone, I am The Answer, and I will be conducting this Google s I mean, lengthy an investigation. And turns out, software piracy is what he's only serving two years of his sentence for, because Jeremiah Mondell did a hell of a lot more than software piracy. This dingus is also serving time for identity theft and mail fraud. He sold counterfeit software with multiple PayPal and eBay accounts, making over a whopping $400,000 in profits from a collective retail price of over $1 million of stolen software. Jeremiah isn't your run-of-the-mill scurvy software pirate who just wanted to give a copy to his friend. No, he was running a software piracy empire of one. He's also a hacker who managed to get people's bank account numbers, real names, and passwords. Frankly, I'm surprised this asshole only got 4 years, 450 hours of community service, and over $225,000 of the profits due in damages. So all I have to say is, this is intellectually dishonest garbage, and shame on them for not disclosing what else Mandela was in for. Thank you so much for your thought-provoking analysis, Answer. We'll meet again, I assure you that. Software piracy is a complicated subject to talk about, and making it digestible for elementary school audiences is no easy task, but by presenting copying software as an unconditional evil, it doesn't educate, but rather brainwashes the kids, telling them what to think, rather than using it as an opportunity to explore this issue further and present their arguments in class, including the use of copying for not only shareware software, but open source software as well. And you just know these videos are very one-sided if the educators they were designed for are also criticizing them, like in this New York Times article I found from the 90s. Especially lower class school districts that need to save as much money as possible with making copies of educational software so all students would be able to use the computer to enhance their learning experience. I know some would argue that the city should then increase funding for schools, but I've lived long enough to know that the things that should be done are rarely the things that can be done, especially by a governing body that cares more about the interests of lobbyists rather than the rest of the population it affects. Well, both of these videos definitely fail to explain the opposing points of view, which is why I'm doing it. 
You know, it's crazy. With the rapid changing climate of the computer world, it's crazy how many of these arguments are very similar to the ones made today, if not the exact same. Regardless of whether you're for or against copying that floppy, I am Alec the Psyquestian Gentleman, and I just copied that floppy. That's right, I just copied the floppy of a video game I got with my own Xmas money. <laughs> what are they going to do? I mean, it's 2021, right? They can't arrest me for copying floppy disks. Nobody cares about that. Steam is what it's all about, right? Well, folks, as a result of copying that floppy, I'm in the slammer. Until my lawyer Evan gets me out of this crap hole, I'm going to have to find something to do because there's nothing for me to review here. No good movies around. There's no video games, so... I could take Bubba's dance class after lunch, but rumor is he's a very mean square dancer from Tennessee and he got in here for murdering a contest judge, so I do hope things go well. Seems like a nice guy. I'm back, I'm back, it's me, DP. Digital protector for creativity. Don't copy that floppy, was when floppies were new. Now we copy much more than floppies could do. So Jason and his freshman crew say chillin' at his dorm, playing games and tunes. New games come out, Jason says he's got the link. One stroke of a key, and he sells it to his click now. Ever since he's got the lick, he's the man of the town. Whole school knows his tricks, and he's feeling his crown. Every new Computer, I'm home. Welcome home, Sidequestian gentlemen. You have one new video message. Would you like to view it? Only one new video message? That's a bit surprising. Well, alright. Hello, Sidequestian gentlemen. Tis I, Fetch Your Claws, here to bring you special holiday greetings. You know what? I think I might have something for you. Ho hold on a second. Oh, yes! A special gift from my minion, Buggy. My little four-legged friend. He's not here right now. It's past his bedtime. But he did want me to leave this for you. What could it be? Oh! Oh, what the hell is that? Oh! Oh my god! Okay, now I understand why it took him a couple of days for him to put this in the box. Well, I guess I just wanted to say Merry Christmas, you son of a bitch. Good day. Okay, that explains this box on the porch. What the hell is it? Oh my god, how the hell did this get through Gateway Customs? I believe that has been shut down with the whole multiverse-wide government shutdown, with the Psyquestian government not agreeing to new terms. Would you like me to dispose of it? Please do. This is freaking disgusting. Very well then. Would you like to renew your firewall subscription? Your services have been expired for the past three months. Oh crap, I forgot to renew that. Oh jeez, I just hope no interdimensional hackers have been trying to get through the gateway. Very well then, your payment has been submitted. 